and the way in which this roundtable unfolds. This roundtable is going to focus on Europe. The promising title is How to Build a Positive Europe. I'm sure that uh, you're all convinced Europeans. Susan George, Attack France, the NGO Attack. He'll spell out what the NGO does and its European dimension. Philippe Lambert, who's an MP, a Euro MP for the Ecology Group, and Arash Derambarsh, who is an MP, Courbevoie. As I'm very polite, I'll give the floor first to uh, Mrs. George. And she's going to talk about her vision of a more positive Europe. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I would like to thank the Positive Economy team for this invitation and for this opportunity. To answer the question, I'd like to start by saying that to make create a positive Europe, you have to dismantle negative Europe, because particularly since the single act of 20 years ago, the Commission in particular, but Europe in general, has hugely increased the number of negative anti-democratic uh, activities. Everything we want to change as a TAC but also in the world in general for NGOs in Europe, we're all, all of a single mind in that respect. And I'd like to thank Europe to a degree for having unified organizations in France and all around the member countries because we are now waging our combat together on the basis of full agreement. And that's why I say we have to remain European. If you feel that you're a European citizen, which is the case of more and more people, then I think that we have some probability of changing things. But current Europe, for me and for many people, is the perfect example of neoliberalism. In other words, a political configuration where uh, people trust the market, people think that competitiveness uh, should reign supreme, and competition will be achieved through lowering wages and destroying the European model. I'm exaggerating on purpose granted, but uh, to state things briefly, that's basically how the situation stands. The fact that Europe went into the free uh, uh, trade negotiations with the US, you probably know that I'm American originally, I know the country well, but I am a French citizen, I feel very European, and I do not want what the European Commission appears to want to take place, that is, full integration or deep integration with the U.S. Now, you will have probably read that TAFTA has been halted. Mr. Holland and his minister declared that they didn't want TAFTA anymore, and uh, uh, you probably may think it's uh, all over. No, it's going to start again in October in New York, the negotiations. In the meantime, people are focusing on CETA, that is the agreement between Europe and Canada. And I think they feel they can sell this to the French because people view Canada as a sort of a vast uh, frontier. Canadians are all nice people and Americans are not. But I don't know whether you're familiar with Canada, but you should realize that it's dominated by uh, transnational American companies. 50% of all the food produced is produced by 5% of farmers. It's an industrial model. Canadians 
have regulations that aren't nearly as good as the European ones. I can give you some details if you're interested. We are afraid that uh, if CETA goes through, then the U.S. will get everything they want because CETA contains the ESDS Investor to State Dispute Settlement. Its settlement dispute an investor can uh, complain against the state for any legislative or other measures that may damage the current or future uh, profits of the company. This exists in hundreds and thousands of investment treaties, and it was begun because there were states you couldn't trust, where you couldn't trust the legal system. But Canada, France, Germany are not the Republic of Congo. I think that we can trust our legal systems. ESDS enables foreign companies only, not uh, national companies, to file complaints against the government because of any uh, future or present uh, measures that might hamper their profits. Furthermore, Canada does not recognize the precautionary principle, which is the principle that pre prevails in Europe and which saves us from measures which might destroy the environment, Canadians, for example, don't respect the precautionary principle and even allow a lot of poisons which we have refused. For example, GMOs, that's not poison, but Canada, like the US, says your decisions are not based on science. We also have also legislated against hormones in meat, yet Canada uh, allows hormone uh, stuffed uh, uh, beef and certain substances in uh, pork. So if we sign this, and that seems to be what President Holland wants to do, but maybe the Germans too, if we sign this, it means we will be accepting something that has already been negotiated and that cannot be uh, revisited. There's a special cause whereby you can't go back on a previous decision. You have to drop a negative list for services and say this is not open to foreign competition. For example, you could say primary education is not open to competition uh, from abroad. But if you haven't specified this, and the list is, will be a long one, you have to list each area, like primary education, secondary education, and so on and so forth. If you haven't included a specific item on the list, that means it is open to foreign competition. It's a negative list. That means that uh, everything that's not on the list is open to competition. So that could be very dangerous. Some of you may recall that in 2005, we had a referendum on the uh, constitutional treaty. The French voted against uh, to the tune of 55%. And a couple of days later, 61% of the Dutch. And then a few months later, there was another country that voted against each country was ignored by uh, the commission. So there was France, the Netherlands, and uh, Ireland, which voted against. So a few months later, uh, something that was exactly the same, minus the uh, stars in the, uh, uh, the, the flag, uh, Beethoven's uh, hymn, and so on. Uh, well, Philip, uh, uh, no doubt, will agree with me uh, and reinforce what I'm saying. But what I'm trying to state, well, here's an example. 
I had an interview in Spain with a person who was giving me the details about unemployment in Spain, young people uh, unemployed to the tune of 40 percent, and this person said at the end, and neoliberalism doesn't work. And I said, well, madam, neoliberalism works extremely well. It works very well indeed in terms of what it's supposed to do. And what's it done for the what has it done for the past 40 years? It has created the greatest transfer of funds in history. A transfer from work, that is people who have a salary to capital. Capital based on profit, unearned income, capital 30 years ago amounted to 30% of the annual uh, GDP of Europe on average. It varied a bit depending on the country, but it amounted to about 30% for the whole of Europe in the 70s. Now, 10% capital now represents 40% of the value of European GDP versus 60% for uh, work or labor. That means that 10% of the value of GNP has been transferred to capital. That, in financial terms, means about uh, One million six hundred thousand billion euros every year, and that's something that uh, uh, doesn't trickle down to ordinary people who actually work and who have no capital. So, on the strength of that, people have less money in their pockets. Inequalities have uh, grown. And we can see that in Europe, people are investing less in infrastructure, education, and so on and so forth. So I'd be very happy to create a positive Europe. I do not want to leave Europe. Maybe later we can also talk about how we can achieve greater equality in Europe. I'm sure there are means to achieve this end, but basically, Unfortunately, I think it's first necessary to undo things before we will have fertile ground to create a positive Europe. That's what I wanted to say. And I hope I didn't speak at too great a length. Philippe Lambert, uh, you're a uh, European member of uh, Parliament, or uh, member of the European Parliament. Maybe I have a provocative question after Mrs. George. In three elements, is there an agreement that would be possible between both parties? The precautionary principle, it's uh, the only one in the world. It doesn't mean we're not doing anything while the others are working. And what about protectionism? These values are not necessarily uh, <laughs> positive. Well, I told you I would be asking provocative questions. Yeah. Uh, well, well, well. I don't know whether there will be an agreement, but um, I do agree with Susan about the uh, much ado around this uh, free trade uh, uh, agreement. Uh, five years ago, we uh, didn't talk about this. Uh, Agreeing, and I'm happy uh, that uh, people are talking about it at last. I receive 80% of the invitations I receive that are to talk about these topics. Uh, are there going to be agreements? The agreement with the uh, with Canada has been uh, is going to be signed in October and ratified afterwards. And uh, all these uh, 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 gesticulations, uh, uh, what uh, Hollande is saying is just uh, to. Uh, hide the fact that they are in favor of these free trade associations, so they want this uh, uh, free trade uh, agreement with uh, Canada to go uh, forward, and uh, this is uh, really a Trojan horse uh, for uh, American companies that will be able to use these uh, 
uh, specific uh, dispute settlement systems to attack the state. You were talking about protectionism. I'm a deeply ingrained sovereignist. That means I'm very deeply attached to the hierarchy of norms between the state and the market. Therefore, I wish that our democracies remain sovereign uh, democracies, that they choose what influences their future. Now, the very logic of these three trade agreements consists in uh, submitting democracies to the uh, decision not of arbiters but of uh, multinational companies, uh, those that can uh, 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 have uh, markets with the frontiers that are different from the democratic space. Of course, there's a local, regional, national, European uh, uh, democratic space uh, at a European level that it is uh, in the making, but there is uh, a beginning, there's a seed for a European democratic space, but as far as I know, there's not a transatlantic uh, seed of a democratic space. Hence, those companies that would be applying these free trade agreements, transatlantic agreements, would be in a position to play states against each other. The principle of this single European market is this very principle. It's a single market. The frontiers are the outer frontiers of the 28 states. But with 28 different jurisdictions, for example, in, in social matters, tax matters, hence what we see every day, Apple is a recent case, how uh, companies use this to uh, look for the uh, lowest bidder. So it is a, a competition that really pulls standards downwards. What is very important for me is that we think that democracies are should set the rules. So it is possible to cross European frontiers for good services and capitals. However, a number of rules should be abided uh, 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 by. Uh, you could uh, uh, call this uh, uh, protectionism. I call this democracy. You tell me uh, uh, protectionism is not a positive word. Protection, I think, is a positive word. But there is, uh, say, Europe is a free trade area. If you go to the United States, the United States are a protectionist country, so is China. In the United States, you have something that I think is very good, which is the uh, Buy American Act, which means that if you are a uh, uh, national or administration or in a county in an American state, you can. Uh, uh, really privilege local supplies. Uh, Alstom just uh, uh, won the bid for the uh, high speed train between uh, Boston and Washington. But in order to do so, they had to commit themselves to uh, make these trains in uh, the states. Uh, do you think there's a, 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 a by European act? No, there isn't, because it's not considered as uh, positive. This is how naive the Europeans are. They are in favor of free trade. Uh, they are like the uh, on the, the couple that goes uh, naked to uh, uh, to a, uh, when all other people are dressed. So Susan is right on something. What is Europe? Europe are three institutions. The European Commission, 28 um, commissioners uh, uh, named by the governments of the member states and authorized, uh, uh, approved by the European Parliament. European Parliament, 751 MEPs uh, elected by the very same uh, citizen that elect regional, national, uh, local assemblies, the very same uh, people. And there is the council with the 21 governments of the state, the 28 governments of the uh, states in the unit. So when you say the commission wants, the commission wants, no. The majorities in power in Europe do want. If tomorrow there's a, a treaty with Canada, if tomorrow DAFTA is approved, it will be because the political majorities in power in Europe will have wanted it to take place. François Hollande wants free trade agreement just as Angela Merkel wants. 
This is what majorities are about in Europe. It's not the Commission. The Commission is the pro product of major majorities in power in the European area. The interest of the European level is that it enables the national governments to do exactly the contrary of what they claim to be doing without it to uh, without it being too obvious. So you have Holland here saying that we do not want the transatlantic trade uh, uh, agreement, but France gave mandate to the Commission in the beginning of July to go on negotiating. As as far as I know, the government hasn't changed in the meantime in France. Well, maybe I'm mistaken there. So that's what it is. It is. It enables them to do the contrary of what they say. Have another example. Uh, uh, let's talk about uh, Sarkozy, not only about Hollande. I was a, a European MP towards the end of uh, Sarkozy's mandate, and I remember when he said, "You know, the time of bonuses for bank is over. Now is the time for uh, uh, negative rewards." At that time, we were negotiating a text for the uh, European Parliament, and I was rapporteur for the Greens. And in this text, we inserted the first measures to limit. Uh, positive awards. And the French representative in the council was the most staunchly opposed to any rule against negative uh, uh, rewards. So at the same time, you had somebody in the Ministry of Economy in France was saying exactly the contrary uh, the, 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 um, the elected king in France. So how is that only possible? This is the type of Europe we are facing, a Europe with a political majority that is pushing uh, for um, uh, the uh, neoliberal uh, economic uh, philosophy, saying we must extend the role of the market. We know what the market does. We saw that in 2008. They know how efficient the market is, how efficient the market forces are. And uh, on top of it, we have to aim competitiveness not on the basis of the value, but on the basis of cost. So the cost factor, which is the uh, adjustment uh, uh, level, are wages, direct and indirect income from work, wages and social security have to be brought down in order to, to be more competitive. And therefore, we need to reduce the role of the state. This is what's happening in Europe, uh, born by the consensus between mainstream parties over the last 30 years. Of course, uh, uh, Macron in the PS, in, in the Socialist Party uh, uh, 10 years ago, it was an, uh, not imaginable, but it is a reality today. So this is what we are facing. So can we have a positive Europe? I think so. We've seen that before. What was the uh, European Union project originally? It was peace on this continent through two means. First of all, extending uh, freedoms and democracy, make sure that we cannot again find ourselves with fascist regimes. And when you see the work done by the Allies to a draft a German constitution that made it uh, very difficult. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of uh, laws against uh, freedom that are being voted in France that would have been impossible in Germany because of the way the German constitution was drafted. And as far as the market is concerned, sharing in the, uh, the uh, economic West. And this is what we've seen for 30 years at the beginning of the European construction. We had the establishment of tax systems that worked to uh, spread wealth and uh, that and, and the, the social security was extended. These 30 uh, uh, very uh, good years, that's what they were about. And when you look at the inequality of, uh, of wealth, uh, Piketty, or in, in income, I can suddenly you realize that, ah, uh, how strange. During, for 30 years, the inequalities in wealth and income uh, were reduced in Europe. And then there was this neoliberal revolution. The uh, construction of Europe continues. So does growth, about 2% a year since the beginning of the neoliberal revolution. But inequalities in wealth and uh, income explode, and more and more people are left on the side. Nowadays, even in Germany, 25% of uh, the uh, European people are at risk of being excluded and uh, in poverty. And you're surprised about the Front National, the UK party, the AFD party, the extreme right movements all over the place? 
Of course, we've always had fascist movement, racist movements in Europe, but they were very marginal. How are they now uh, claiming to be representing 30, 35% of the population? Because a great chunk of our population, rightfully so, feels, because they can measure it with uh, their, in in their income every day, they feel really abandoned. So a positive Europe for me would be a Europe that uh, retakes this original ambition, peace through uh, freedom and through uh, 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 shared wealth in a sustainable way. Uh, met uh, Jean-Paul Juncker and Monday. Uh, is that what he has in mind? No. Is that what they're talking about in Bratislava today? No. They think they answer the crisis by saying we're going to establish uh, the Europe in the, the, the area of defense. Uh, with uh, just headquarters and, and, and buying a couple of cannons? Uh, is that what they're going to do? No. How can they hope that people who are about to vote for a fascist country are going to be convinced and next year decide to vote for a positive project when I come in and I love France and I hope to uh, end my life in France? All my friends in France. Tell me, honestly, we don't know what to do. If that's the political offer, what can we do? We uh, can only choose between mainstream politicians, whether they're left uh, on the left uh, uh, or on the right, which doesn't mean anything anymore, and uh, the extreme right. Of course, there are some uh, small groups uh, at the left uh, of, of the left, but uh, not very uh, important. And this on a continent that has never been that so rich before. So there is something wrong here, isn't there? So now this uh, conclusion uh, at uh, European level, can you uh, can you feel it at local level in Courbevoie, for example? Thank you, uh, all of you. Uh, I'm really happy to be uh, talking uh, to these uh, people. I was uh, elected in March 2014. I'd like to thank the organizers of the LH Forum, Audrey, uh, Mr. Tali, Sonia Diop, uh, Isabel Lefort, uh, Joy. My parents come from Iran. They arrived in 1979 because they wanted a positive Europe. They didn't go to the United States or elsewhere. They went to Europe. They came to France. Could have been Belgium, but they came to France. And I was born in Paris. I'm a child of the revolution, born in 1979, proud to be French. And I wanted to uh, uh, give back what my parents had found, and I will always feel uh, grateful because, as far as I'm concerned, it's the most beautiful country of the world. Uh, I had difficulties at school. Uh, probably, you know, I. I, I uh, uh, I had problems in school, and uh, uh, nevertheless, I uh, I'm, I just uh, I'm going to be a, a lawyer, and uh, I'm. Uh, I've got a PhD in law, but I find this is a country that enables you to touch your dreams. And I wanted to give back what I had received, and I thought politics is what enables you to give meaning to what you do. So I was elected in uh, Courbevoie, in a city which is uh, uh, close to La Défense, one of the uh, major economic platforms in Europe, four hectares uh, this city. And the first operation I uh, made was linked with something which I considered linked with a, a difficult story uh, because I, I once felt very hungry. It's much easier for me to talk about it right now. When I was a, a young man, I had earned 800 euros, and uh, I, after paying my rent, I didn't have much to, to, to live on and to, to eat on. And, uh, uh, it's not very uh, well seen to talk about these things. You're supposed to uh, feel good. and uh, But uh, I think that uh, when you have problems, you have to uh, try and see the positive sides of them. And uh, I realize how incredible it is to see so much uh, food wasted. And I asked my mom, why, why, why do people throw things away in a dustbin and, and somebody goes and rummages? 
uh, to and, and she said well it's because the, this somebody is uh, hungry at 19 I started working I'd eat uh, pasta something that happens to a number of uh, people when they are students a couple of months after I got uh, elected in, in Courbevoie, I went to uh, several supermarkets, Franprix and Monoprix. Uh, I hope they're not uh, partners to LH Forum, otherwise they might not be partners next week. Uh, next uh, year, sorry. Uh, but this is a, a totally personal uh, story. And they said, no, no, uh, you need to have a, a cold store. And so uh, the cold store was very expensive, and I said, uh, I don't have money. And the, the bosses in Monoprix and Franprix said, if you don't have a cold store, we won't uh, give you uh, the, the food for, for you and for others. And I uh, um, looked at what was happening at 8 p.m. and how they were throwing this away. And I say, I mean, aren't you ashamed? You know, there are people waiting for your leftovers, and you're just pouring chlorine over them. I went to see Carrefour Market, and I said, maybe in five years, I'm the next Meyer. You don't know. And I remember that. And, uh, you know, I'll put a signposting so that people uh, come and buy here instead of Franprix and Monoprix. And he said, fantastic. <laughs> and he gave me what he hadn't sold. And uh, he, he thought this would last for only two months. And he didn't know what he was letting him himself, uh, letting himself in for. Because I sent journalists. We were three volunteers in the beginning. And what I did is that I used uh, uh, a loophole in legislation. I didn't have a cold store. I didn't have the logistics to store this. But I went to see nutritionists and doctors and they say, if you give this uh, uh, this food out immediately, then you can do it. So this is what we did every night, 50 kilos, about 500 euros every night. And we could give food to uh, uh, about 50 uh, people, this invisible uh, middle class, uh, Philip Lambert mentions, 25% uh, in Germany, the, the 10 million people in France. On the 10th of the month, they have no money left on their bank account. Uh, uh, um, uh, mothers on their own with kids, uh, people who are uh, old age pensioners, they, they are the people who don't go to vote or who vote for the National Front. And they are the people, 40%, they represent 40% of abstention in elections. Or oh, the National Front, which I uh, listened to yesterday, you have a, 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 an old age pensioner or an entrepreneur who say, now I vote for the National Front. This is the failure of democracy. This is the failure of, of Europe. When you don't look at people who are hungry, who are thirsty, then you create a bomb that only wants to explode. So I set up a, a, a petition. I asked uh, Mathieu Kassowitz. Uh, uh, there were the uh, Charlie Hebdo attacks in France. Our objective was only uh, we, we wanted to okay we wanted to, to fight uh, uh, terrorism but then it was the only topic about which people talked uh, people talk about equality in France but they don't talk about fraternity very much uh, when our republic was created was freedom uh, uh, ownership, property, and uh, uh, fraternity. Fraternity came last. Uh, brotherhood, it's not only solidarity, it's stronger than uh, uh, solidarity. And we have to get back to basics as humans. Uh, you cannot uh, allow people to, uh, go, uh, uh, to go hungry. My brother has been living in the United States since uh, the age of 19. I went to Hollywood Boulevard to buy, you know, the uh, I love uh, uh, Hollywood uh, magnet for my uh, um, uh, for my fridge and I could I would see uh, people sitting on the on the floor and uh, uh, a, a, a policeman giving them a fine and I was thinking what does this mean these are not our values these are not human values in Europe we have to to have human values. We uh, organized a, a, a petition to over 210,000 people signed on change.org with the support of uh, a number of associations, uh, Bono's Foundation, One France. And I also used at the same time uh, legislative tools uh, when there was an amendment, uh, a draft law from the government, the Macron uh, legislation with uh, 
400 billion laws within, uh, you tend to get mixed up. And we managed to get the amendment through in second reading with hardly anybody in the Senate. The two things we wanted to work on is uh, making it compulsory for uh, the supermarket to give what they hadn't sold to the association they chose. There was a debate, uh, five minutes, and uh, the uh, the lobbyists managed to restrict the field of what we wanted to do. I went to see the senators. Uh, are you pulling my leg? Ten minutes before you say it's all right, we'll all vote for it. And then now you change uh, so-called details that make a huge difference. That means that if a supermarket doesn't want to give us the leftovers, then they don't. And uh, they need to be uh, much bigger and, and smaller supermarkets are not uh, obliged to do it. We redacted a second draft, a second and royal energy transition. The amendment was uh, uh, voted, but it was the last read. There was a problem, a problem, a formal problem. The Constitutional Council uh, uh, cancelled this amendment, but we didn't give up, and we did something that's very rare in the Fifth Republic. We submitted the same draft, a draft from a, 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 an MP to the, the, in front of the Senate and in front of the Assemblée Nationale. At the same time, Mrs. Uh, um, Royal uh, wanted to launch an agreement and said, no, we need a law. One third of uh, big supermarkets depend uh, from the FCD. If Mr. Monoprix and Mr. Carrefour, Mr. what's his name, uh, Auchan say, well, sign this agreement, it will only represent one third of a major uh, supermarket. The rest are franchisees. I'm not in favor of 50 billion laws. But at the given point in time, you've got to put somebody at the same level and create a legal framework. So the law was passed first reading on 9th of December, a unanimous vote. Then the shuttle, 3rd of February, unanimity, one of the fastest uh, voted uh, law uh, under the Fifth uh, Republic. Uh, all this within one year with the pressure we were submitted to, uh, particularly me. I, I, I was submitted to a lot of pressure. Uh, some uh, uh, MPs, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, were even submitted to uh, blackmail so that they wouldn't vote in favor. And it's really uh, the honor of the French Parliament to have uh, uh, looked, uh, to have left um, on the side uh, uh, divisions and to have been so efficient. So what does the legislation say? Any citizen today can create his or her own association and go and claim the Leftovers. If the supermarket doesn't want, they have to pay 3,750 euros fine. It's the first time this has been done in the world with a colleague. Uh, not in the entire country, but uh, where things are federal. We set up a second petition last year with the support of the French Red Cross, uh, Cross and Action contre la faim. And this is what brings me to positive Europe or negative Europe, depending on how you view things. Uh, this was based on the Lisbon Treaty. It's called Citizen Initiative. That means that anyone here in the room can, in fact, create a petition, get one million signatures, but the petitioners have to uh, uh, send at least a quarter of the European uh, population. We got the signatures from uh, more than 15 members of the European uh, Union or petitioners like me. And then I heard that this has to be done on the site of the European Union. And to be able to sign, you have to uh, include your uh, ID card number. In other words, they have a file, they have your ID cards. I promise you, sir, that's the way it, it goes. I can promise you that if you don't go through the EU site with your uh, ID number, maybe it's changed, but you have to have your ID number. We were asked for our ideas. And so you, you, the data is put on file. So I thought, no, we're not going to do that. We'll put pressure to bear. 
uh, economy circular capacity, the directive. There is a director on the circular economy. We slipped in an amendment on the 9th July 2015. This was voted three against Germany, Austria, and Poland. Why? Because according to these countries, wasting food, waste food, food, wasted food should be governed by an official entity. There are all sorts of uh, color, uh, cultural identities, there are a number of uh, cultural differences. It's not a problem of left-right, it's just a, a human problem, it's a question of common sense. So now we have a law that works in France, so I don't earn any money, I'm just a municipal councillor, I don't earn any money, I don't have any income from this. I try and do what I can. Thanks to this law and talking to people, and I'd like to thank the organizers for enabling me to talk to you about this project here. Anyone in France uh, can um, push for legislation, but we need support. Uh, the uh, President of the European Commission, if you could help us on this matter, we'd be very grateful. There are 100 million, uh, 100 million people in the EU who are hungry, and this law will enable many of them to have enough food to eat. Thank you very much. We have 10 minutes left. I'd like to ask you a question to all three of you by way of conclusion. When all is said and done, we've heard a lot about local initiatives and what we can all do as citizens. European citizens are losing their trust in Europe. They, they cease to understand what things are all about. They, perhaps they shouldn't uh, expect treaties to solve all problems. Maybe they shouldn't constantly uh, turn to EU uh, representatives. They seem to have lost trust. So why don't we sort of uh, get our act together and do something so things change? Local initiatives might be more effective than major treaties or high-level initiatives. I think we need more rules, but these rules need to comply with what all three of us have been saying. If we want to keep the euro, of course, we not only have the national front, but in France, a lot of people on the left say we should leave the eurozone. I don't agree. French debt will remain in euros and will have to be reimbursed in euros with a, a, a devalued franc. So, heaven knows what that will mean for austerity. I think it would be a very, very bad solution indeed. But what we could imagine is a system like uh, the one Keynes advocated during the Second World War for the world and for world trade. He was proposing that if you have a surplus, just as if you have a deficit, with your euro, you, you can't devalue and you can't uh, let the money uh, go up. But you could uh, take stock of the situation at the end of the year, and then those who have a, a surplus above a certain amount would pay a tax to Europe, which would be redistributed. I think Germany would be against this, but uh, if we don't... Uh, balance out the euro area in a fairer way for countries in the south, things are just going to blow up. Europe keeps saying that it to conduct studies which justify the treaty. The studies are based on an economic model which presupposes full employment. The model says that people who are unemployed will find a new job right away. It's not a problem. And with that, thanks to that, they say people will earn this amount, each family will have that amount, will have created this number of jobs. It's completely wrong. Someone published a study in, on Europe in general with TAFTA and has just 
published a similar study on CETA, and he has shown that on the contrary, Europe, if CETA is ratified, will lose two, uh, more, uh, 230 more thousand jobs and uh, there will be less income. So you can sell just about anything depending on the economic model you choose. I think, therefore, we, have, we need more equitable terms of trade and we should stop well, it's like Alphonse Salé said in the 19th century, if you're looking for money, take it where it's most abundant, that is, uh, amongst the poor. Okay, they don't have uh, much money, but they're very numerous. Thank you, Philip, in terms of local initiatives. Well, that's of capital importance. You saw the film Demain tomorrow here. The film is excellent because it illustrates the fact that living in society is a team sport. You can't expect everything uh, of the uh, captain of the team or the coach. It only works if everyone plays properly. And that's how things can change as well, as uh, uh, if the citizens sort of cease to be active in the society in which they live, that will spell the end of democracy. But I don't ask the question or, but and. As you stated, there are structures, and these structures are enshrined in our law, and these structures establish the power of some to the detriment of others. That's why you insisted on a law, not a non-binding agreement, because sometimes you have to act on the structures themselves. And if you vote for these laws, you can change something in the structure of uh, retail in France, for example. So it's both one and the other. To say I don't trust democratic structures anymore, and it's interesting in the film Demain, but that's not the actual message. You can't trust politicians anymore, so let's organize ourselves where we are, perhaps alongside or outside society. While we're doing this, if we don't change the structure which exploits people, then the structure will continue to wreak havoc. But if you say, okay, I'm going to entrust my future to the enlightened elite, that also is a major mistake, because what do you know? Basically, our political elites, so, so to speak, have been taken over by, by uh, lobbies, special interests. Uh, the general interest doesn't, uh, is represented by only 1% of the population. So we need to create a, a sort of a fruitful tension within the system. Citizens need to become uh, individually but also collectively mobilized to make things change and to invest the political arena. That's what you've done. You didn't say, okay, I'm going to turn to my MP. I'm going to uh, uh, join uh, mm, the game. Instead of uh, leaving the terrain to politicians, I think it's very important to invest the terrain. This uh, was the philosophy of a former uh, prime minister. Thank you very much. I imagine you agree with this. I'm deeply interested in what uh, Susan and Philip have said. It's very interesting indeed. I've learned a lot. If there's one thing we need to change, it's corruption and conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest kill the positive democracy in Europe. It's absolutely necessary to uh, combat it. When I waged my campaign, people said to me, well, the food lobby is really powerful. I was given to understand that I shouldn't uh, try and do anything about it. Same thing for the EU. They finance a lot of things. So you have to demand. You are all citizens. You're all French here. Next year, you're going to have to vote. Doesn't matter how you vote, but go to vote and demand uh, that the politicians be transparent, don't hold several different positions. Uh, you have to be really demanding. Uh, ask for a new political class. Be very demanding. These are people who will have an impact on your lives. One final word, if I may. The rule of the game 
Well, you have citizens, you can have an impact on the rule of the game. It's not worth saying we can't change anything. You can change things. You have to vote for people who resemble you and who are accountable. I like what Philip said. Thank you very much. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Arash. Just one minute. I'd like to say that to stop TAFTA and CETA, there's a group of Europeans who have tried to convince the Commission to accept a popular re referendum. The Commission calls for one million uh, signatures on a petition by people in at least seven countries. And there's a quota system which has to be complied with, a quota system laid down by Europe. They turned us down. The next day, we decided to go ahead anyway and organize things with citizens. In the space of a year, we got 3.4 million signatures from three times the number of necessary countries. All the countries of the three Baltic states, uh, uh, Cyprus and Malta as well. And everyone worked together, both in Eastern and Western Europe. It's the first time, to my knowledge, that we agreed on such a major topic. And there, I truly felt that I was a European citizen. And it, the aim was to dismantle things. You have to disobey, dismantle, in order to rebuild. Thank you very much.